Hey everybody, I'm Lance Goyke, and today we're going to talk about hip extension range of motion and how do you figure out what kinds of flexibility is normal for you. So I came across this article, which I think is worth kind of diving into. It's from 2008, uh, Elson and Aspinall. It's called Measurement of Hip Range and Oh, Jesus. Measurement of hip range <laughs> of flexion, extension, and straight leg raising. Okay. I don't know why that was so hard to say. Short version is they're trying to come up with a better way to measure hip extension. Uh, so generally people are laying prone face down on a table like this. The uh, tester lifts up the leg. They grab right about under the knee and then pull superiorly towards the ceiling. Better picture, there you go. Or you could do it actively like that. That other picture was just showing where she's just lifting her leg. Nobody else is doing it. And that is our first difference that's probably worth talking about. There's a difference between passive range of motion and active range of motion. And I think it's, it's important to talk about that because it's especially important today when we're talking about hip extension. Hip extension is really susceptible to a difference in active and passive range of motion. And part of that is because of the shape of the joint and the other part of that is because of the musculature around it. So let's say I have this person laying down. I'm the practitioner here. I put my right hand on the sacrum to stabilize the pelvis. I pull the thigh upward to measure my hip extension. That is a passive range of motion. The, the person that I am measuring does not have to uh, control the leg at all. The, the practitioner is providing all of these external inputs that then stabilize you. So this will tell me passive hip extension range of motion. I might test 40 degrees here, but then when I go and I let go as a practitioner, the practitioner lets go and then the person being tested lets the leg come up, uh, that measurement might be zero degrees or five degrees or 10 degrees. And part of that is just because the shape of the joint isn't allowing all of this. But the biggest reason is just that the glute gets so short that it can't lift up anymore. The hip extensors get sh so short that they can't lift the hip up anymore. So as far as active range of motion, the numbers that we generally say are somewhere around 10 or 20 degrees is considered normal. The second thing that I want to kind of talk about, so what is stopping the range of motion? Well, part of it is the shape of the joint. The shape is this ball inside of a, a socket, but it's not always <laughs> perfectly spherical and it's dependent upon the position of the pelvic bones and the sacrum. So the sacrum can kind of like steer the pelvic bones and orient them differently. So sometimes the bone is just in the way. You have a bony block. I wouldn't say this is quote, bone on bone, where you have diminished dissipation of forces and you have more arthritis in a joint or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about here, though that probably increases or decreases your mobility, increases the likelihood that you have less mobility, right? What I'm talking about here is more just orientation of socket, uh, preventing the hip bone, the ball, from rolling around. You'll notice more differences in hip positioning mobility if you have very taut ligaments. Now ligaments are, well, let's just show you the picture. There are three major hip ligaments around the hip joint. Uh, we might call all of this together the hip capsule. There's an anterior hip capsule and there's a posterior hip capsule. The posterior hip capsule, which we can start with, uh, is comprised of this ischiofemoral ligament, which you see here on the right. And then the anterior hip capsule has two different uh, muscles here or not muscles, not muscles, explicitly not muscles, ligaments here, iliofemoral and pubofemoral. So now uh, these ligaments check hip motion. So when you stretch a muscle, right, you stretch it and it's like a rubber band and it returns back to shape. Ligaments, on the other hand, if you stretch a really long way, they, they're not like a rubber band, they're more like a spring. So normally they will help you come back, but if you go too far, if you stretch too far, you have this deformation where they no longer check that motion. So somebody with really extensive uh, flexibility training or hip range of motion, like somebody who's done gymnastics all their life, they spend a lot of time practicing mobility, practicing flexibility, and they're not gonna have the same checks in their hip motion. All right, so back to the article, measurement 
of hip range of flexion extension and straight leg raising. Uh, we're gonna talk more about this flexion extension thing. So what they did, it, that's kind of the picture. Their point was, if you stand up straight, there should be a curve in your back. That should be the neutral spinal position and it should determine a neutral sacral position as well. When you're measuring somebody, this picture was so close that I couldn't get what they were doing. This on the left is a leg and this on the right is like a cutout in the, you saw it up here, uh, cut out in the shirt that's showing her back. And then underneath there is a hand. That is the practitioner's hand who is measuring and somewhat securing the uh, lumbosacral junction. So the end of the spinal vertebra and then the start of the sacrum. So we do that to get an indication of, quote, true hip extension and flexion. We don't want, as a, if we're trying to understand what is the hip joint itself, the acetabulofemoral joint, what is that single joint itself able to do without considering that, hey, sometimes I can bend my knee up more because I round my back. So if I look at that, I use that hand to isolate only hip motion, what they were finding was a pretty broad range actually of measurements. 80 <laughs> to 140 degrees of flexion and five to 40 degrees of extension. And they have the uh, distribution, not exactly the distribution, but a little bit, some more statistics here. The mean of hip flexion was 85. So really close to 80. That's, that's actually pretty interesting. But the most common measurement they got was 110. And then uh, for the extension, the numbers were actually a lot more, it seems normally distributed. So uh, your mean was a lot more in the middle of the range uh, around 25 degrees. As a practitioner, what you can do then is you can go to maximum flexion here using the hand as kind of a guide to block that, that sacrum from moving. And then once you get to the end of flexion, you can push past, you can remove your hand from underneath the practitioner, you can push past and flatten the back into the uh, bench that you're laying on, or that they called it a couch, but I, I just picture a couch is so soft, that's not what you want to use. You're, you're going to push the back down into the thing, that's going to posteriorly tilt the pelvis, which is hip extension. And that's an important concept to get, so I'll say it again. You're gonna remove the hand, you're gonna posteriorly tilt the pelvis by flexing that other leg up, and then that is going to be your hip extension. And you'll watch the leg, and it's not gonna flex this much, but I, I mean, I suppose if you push hard enough, it will, but you're gonna watch the leg be flat on the bench, and you're gonna push the other leg, her right leg here, as far as you can until this thigh starts to raise up. And that difference in hip flexion that you then have is motion of posterior pelvic tilt at the pelvis is hip extension. So that will tell you your hip extension range of motion. Now that's not a bad way to do it. It is a good way to isolate the active hip range of motion. The, the only caveat that I have, or well, two caveats that I have that I wanna bring up here are first, hip extension changes based on the position of the pelvis. So if you're restricting pelvic motion, you're also kind of restricting ra available range of motion at that true joint, like at the joint that you're measuring. Even though we're taking this stuff out of it, this these motions don't occur in isolation. And so a test like that, I don't see as being super useful uh, unless you're you're like really specifically measuring, is there a, a block or a limitation inside the hip joint, which can be useful, especially in like a surgical consult kind of situation. But as far as a mostly healthy individual, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And that leads me to my next point, which is the most important thing for a healthy individual trying to be, you know, more than healthy, above average, is being able to move these joints actively and independently. So there's this concept of dissociation of movement, which is, which is really just mobility itself. So if I can extend my hip without changing my back position, then I'm probably gonna be pretty good at deadlifting. But if I can't do that, if I can't bend over to reach the bar on the ground for a deadlift, 
without rounding my back a little bit more. And I can't stand all the way up because I don't have access to my hip extension and I end up arching my back to get there instead. I'm probably gonna have a really tight back after I deadlift, so we don't want that. Um, so to me, this dissociation of movement is more important. Now, granted, this is just an article, and I think they did a good job of coming up with a new test. This is this is pretty, uh, I'm curious about it. I, I haven't used it, but it seems like it would be a good measurement. Now, the last point that I want to make here, I brought up an article that I wrote about butt wink. So butt wink, short version, is it's a, it's a mobility limitation in a squat where as I get to the bottom of the, the squat, I've run out of hip motion, and so I bend at the back instead to get extra motion. You can see in my thumbnail here, Allison's got a really deep squat here uh, with a flat back position. She's got a less deep squat, more bent over squat here with a hyper extended upper back and a hyper flexed lower back here. This is the most common type of butt wink. And then a less common, but still you know able to do is as you go down, just everything bends and kind of collapse and flexes. Um, so both of these on the right are wrong. And we're looking for something that's more like the one on the left. Now, way down in this article, this novel of an article. Hope you like it. Feel free to check it out. Uh, I've got some drawings that I had commissioned uh, about various hip socket shapes and uh, bone shapes. Hip socket depth is a really important interperson individuality kind of thing. So when you have a deeper hip socket, the socket covers more of the ball of the hip joint and you get less pressure in the joint and you can disperse the forces through the hip over a broader area, right? So you tend to have healthier joints over the long term, but you tend to have less mobility because you have a bone in the way and it's a normal in the way kind of thing. You're not gonna stretch yourself out of it too much. If, if you take somebody instead with a shallow hip socket and you have them do a bunch of stretching stuff, like they're gonna move, their leg is just gonna move around like a noodle, like a wet noodle, like there's no resistance, right? They're not gonna do as well with high force activities, but they're gonna have a lot of mobility. If you took someone with a shallow hip and someone with a deep hip and you stretched them really hard for five years, the person with the shallow hip would have crazy mobility or flexibility, I should say. And the person with the deep hip would have less. They would have a lot more than they would have five years ago, but they will have a lot less than the person with the shallow hip. So this is just something to consider. People who tend to like stretching tend to have shallower joints. So don't compare yourself to other people who are super flexible because you might just not have the physiology to support that or the anatomy to support that. The other idea is just like, if you have a hip impingement, it's the same kind of thing. So a hip impingement is an addition of bone. So the bones hit each other and the body doesn't like it. And it says, okay, well, we need to stabilize this joint. Let's put more bone on. Uh, so you can have a cam or a pincer or a mixed hip impingement. And if we look at the mixed one here, I've added bone onto the ball of the hip socket and I've added bone onto this, or uh, not the ball of the hip socket, but the ball of the hip. And then I've added bone onto the hip socket as well. And what that does is it, it limits your mobility. It's just, it makes the hip more of a deep hip, right? All right, that's all I have to say. Let's do a quick recap. So uh, we'll try to go in reverse order. The interpersonal individuality plays into this a lot. I could have a deep or a shallow hip socket and you don't wanna compare one to the other because they're just different. You're not gonna, you're, a deep hip is never gonna be a shallow hip. We talked about testing, we talked about passive range of motion versus active range of motion and how when I have a practitioner stretch my hip, I'm usually gonna get, or, or you know, I didn't say this earlier, but or gravity stretch my hip, I'm probably gonna have a lot more hip extension than if I try to do it on my own. We talked about the integrity of the hip capsule and the ligaments around the hip joint. Uh, if I have more flexibility in the anterior hip capsule, then I'll probably have a lot more hip extension as well because those anterior ligaments are not stopping my hip extension. They're not checking my hip extension. So sometimes if I just keep stretching, I'm just stretching out these ligaments. And, and you know, if you need the mobility, then you gotta do what you gotta do, but that might be suboptimal for some people, especially if you're 
trying to be, you know, like the most well-rounded strength athlete kind of person. And then we went through this new testing, not, I guess it's not new, this is from 2008, but <laughs> we went through this testing of a hip extension where you place your hand underneath someone's back to stabilize the hip, you check hip flexion, and then you remove the hand and then check hip extension on the opposite side. It was just a pretty cool idea. Hope that helps. If you learned something, hit the like button and subscribe to be notified when I release new videos. If you need something else to watch, well, I have a whole hip mobility circuit. I will leave that here.